people of God on this Lenten wilderness journey, what will you eat? The word of the Lord is our daily bread. People of God, in this time of temptation, how will you live? Our hope and faith is in the faithfulness of our God. People of God, at this kingdom crossroad, whom will you serve? We worship the Lord our God alone. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wild. For 40 wilderness days and nights, he was tested by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when the time was up, he was hungry. The devil, playing on his hunger, gave the first test. Since you're God's son, command this stone to turn into a loaf of bread. Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. It takes more to bread, more than bread to really live. For the second test, he led him up and spread out all the kingdoms of the earth that display at once. Then the devil said, they're yours in all their splendor to serve your pleasure. I'm in charge of them all and I can turn them over to whomever I wish. Worship me and they are yours, the whole works. Jesus refused again backing his refusal with Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and only the Lord your God. 
serve him with absolute single-heartedness. For the third test, the devil took him to Jerusalem and put him on top of the temple. He said, if you are God's son, jump. It's written, isn't it, that he has placed you in the care of angels to protect you. They will catch you, and you won't so much as stub your toe on a stone. Yes, Jesus said. But it's also written, don't you dare tempt the Lord your God. And that completed the testing. The devil retreated temporarily, lying in wait for another opportunity. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness in order to give him space for prayer, fasting, and discovering what God had in mind for his life. Here he was, following in the footsteps of his Jewish ancestors, seeking a spiritual experience of God that would undergird his future ministry. But in the wilderness, Jesus also met the devil with gifts of food, security, and power, ready for the taking. By themselves, these gifts were good, but the strings attached to them would have changed the direction of Jesus' life. Jesus chose not to accept the devil's offerings and instead continued to honor his baptism as the beloved Son of God. Our Lord, you were sent to a place wild and vast to ponder your mission, to pray, to fast. Then hungry and weary, you face the night and day, the subtle temptations to turn from God's way. Our Lord, in your struggle, you chose to obey. God's word filled your heart and you trusted God's way. Now risen, you save us from sins that destroy. You give us your spirit, your peace, and your joy.
Jesus, tempted in the desert, lonely, hungry, filled with dread. Use your power, the tempter tells him, turn these barren rocks to bread. Not alone by bread, he answers, can the human heart be filled. Only by the word that calls us is our deepest hunger filled. First, Satan tempted Jesus to perform magic. Command these stones to become loaves of bread. The devil subtly uh, discussed that Jesus deserved better than God was giving him. Why should the Son of God be famished? If you are the Son of God, the devil said, thus daring Jesus to prove who he is by acting like a God instead of like a man. In this story, Jesus proves who he is not by refusing to practice magic. This helps humans learn what son of God really means. A son of God is not someone who is related to God by rising out of his humanity, but someone who is beloved by God for sinking into it, even when he's famished, even when he's taunted by the devil himself. There are plenty of times when we are too tempted to believe that we deserve bigger and better than what we have. The devilish voice in our heads saying things like, if you're a child of God, shouldn't things be going a little smoother for you? I mean, if you're really a Christian, I mean, shouldn't you be happier or healthier, richer, safer? You know what to say right back. Away with you, Satan. I'd rather be a hungry child of God than a well-fed player on your team. Now, shoo. Humans do not live by bread alone, Jesus said in that wilderness. But I imagine angels brought bread at the end of those 40 days, coming to ease his hunger, to sustain him for the path ahead. I am not asking you to take this wilderness from me, to remove this place of starkness where I come to know the wilderness within me, where I learn to call the names of the ravenous beasts that pace inside me, to finger the brambles that snake through my veins, to taste the thirst that tugs at my tongue, but send me tough angels, sweet wine, strong bread, just enough for the path ahead for me.
Jesus, tempted on the mountain by the lure of vast domain, fall before me, be my servant, glory, fame, you're sure to gain. Jesus sees the dazzling vision, but turns his eyes another way. God alone deserves our homage. God alone will I obey. Higher and yet higher, Jesus was led till all the kingdoms of the world lay spread before his eyes, more splendid still than he had ever dreamed. Worship me, and these are yours, the tempter said. Mountains boomed and echoed a thundering no. The Son of Man would choose instead to go where he was sent, to have no place to lay his head, to be content to spread himself cross-beamed above a common hill. How could it be wrong to just once bow the knee, to shake hands with sin, to achieve victory? Yet you made it clear that no matter the cost, your path was obedience, your way was the cross. Jesus goes into the wilderness to prepare for the launching of his public ministry, not to bewail his fate. With wild beasts as companions and angels to minister to him, we begin to see the desert, the dark place, the icon of all the challenging places of life, fill and overflow with light. Satan may be tempting Jesus to look in other directions for life, yes, but the light that flows from the gospel to us is clear. Jesus is not going to go the cheap and easy way in life. Jesus is not going to curl up inside himself and simply let evil have its day. Instead, his message is radiant here. There is no other direction in life that can possibly make us whole than the total dedication to the will of God for the world. Will it cost us? Probably. Can we do otherwise and still live in the light that is flowing out of this desert? Absolutely not. Jesus is about to spend his life on these things. And the energy of that decision 
fairly crackles on him. No dark time this. Surely as followers of Jesus, we need to do the same. To see the light in him and follow it ourselves. The voices of the devil always come at us when we are vulnerable and exposed, thinking maybe this time we will give in. The voice wants to seduce Jesus and us away from God's given humanity. Jesus was sent on a mission to usher in the new rule of God, to displace all the old ordering of life in the voice that said, engage in a little idolatry and you can have everything you want on your own terms. Just give in, just a little. The voice said, cheat a little, split your loyalty, worship me a little on the side and I'll give you everything. Perhaps he would have. But Jesus has got Moses from Sinai ringing in his ears. Worship only the Lord your God and serve him alone. No compromise. No halfway faith, no divided loyalty, because divided loyalty will give you everything you want except your true God-given self. And that comes with an undivided loyalty to the giver of your life.
Jesus tempted at the temple, high above its ancient wall. Throw yourself from lofty turret. Angels wait to break your fall. Jesus shuns such empty marvels, feats that fickle crowds request. God, whose grace protects, preserves us. We must never vainly test. Jesus was not tempted by things that looked bad. Jesus was tempted by things that looked very good. Food when he was hungry, a chance to rule all the kingdoms of the world, and protection from danger. And surely Jesus could rule more justly than the devil, but there was just one catch. Jesus would have to worship someone other than God. But Jesus knew that even the best was not God. The most tempting substitutes will always be things or persons that look very, very good. But only God is God. Sometimes our temptations are likewise about the good versus the better. At other times, we are tempted by the easy instead of the more difficult. And at still other times, we have to choose the lesser of two evils. Choices made with prayer hopefully will lead us in God's direction. We are not guaranteed to always make the right choices but we are guaranteed God's continued presence in a time of correction or adjustment. Though Jesus refused to turn stones into bread, he does feed the hungry. Though he refused political power, the proclamation of God's empire of justice and peace is the focus of his preaching and teaching. Though he refused to jump off the temple to see if God would send angels to catch him, he goes to the cross in confidence that God's will for his life will trump the world's decision to execute him. Game, set, and match to Jesus.
Temptations come to us in moments when we look at others and feel insecure about not having enough. Temptations come in judgments we make about strangers or friends who make choices we do not understand. Temptation rules us, making us able to look away from those in need and to live our lives unaffected by poverty, hunger, and disease. Temptation rages in moments when we allow our temper to define our lives or when addiction to wealth, power, influence over others, vanity, or an inordinate need for control defines who we are. Temptation wins when we engage in the justification of little lies, small sins, a racist joke, a questionable business practice for the greater good, a criticism of a spouse or partner when he or she is not around. Temptation wins when we get so caught up in the trappings of life that we lose sight of life itself. These are the faceless moments of evil that, while mundane, lurk in the recesses of our lives and our souls. Lenten penitence engages the dark places in our lives, that we may come face to face with them, name them, understand them, and seek forgiveness for them. Hope comes as we remember the stories of God at work in the world through the years and in our lives. Hope comes as we accept the fact that we must be faithful disciples of Jesus. Hope often seems like a far off vision, but hope is about the future and that future starts now. Hope strengthens our faith. Hope gives energy to our actions for justice in our community and the world. Hope enlivens our prayers. Hope assures us of God's presence even when we see people hurting, when we see nations fighting, when we see children hungry and cold. May hope provide light on our journey through Lent this year. When we are tested and wrestle alone, famished for bread, when the world offers stone, nourish us, God, by your word and your way, food that sustains us by night and by day. When in the desert we cry for relief, pleading for paths marked by certain belief, lift us to love you beyond sign and test, trusting your presence, our only true rest. When we are tempted to barter our souls, trading the truth for the power to control, teach us to worship and praise only you, seeking your will in the work that we do. When we have struggled and searched through the night, sorting and sifting the wrong from the right, Savior, surround us with circles of care, angels of healing, of hope, and of prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Spirit of integrity, you drive us into the desert to search out our truth. Give us clarity to know what is right and courage to reject what is expedient, that we may abandon the false innocence of failing to choose it all, but may follow the purposes of Jesus Christ throughout this Lent and always. Amen.